I share my screen. Go for it. Over to you, Ben. Thanks so much. Right. Let's see if this works. Uh, can you tell me? We can see the note. There we go, Ben. Whether you can all see that. Is that okay? Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. I'm, we would be <laughs> looking at this a bit earlier on. And uh, it's a bit gloomy, isn't it? I'm sorry. I know that there are much, much better pictures of, of Torrington. This is one I took when I was down the first time. Uh, but I have since been down the second time and met a number of you um, for the second time. So really nice to see some familiar faces. And thank you um, very much for coming. And, and, and Chris, to you for that introduction. Um, so what we're going to do, we've got an agenda for today. It, as, as Chris has said, it'd be really, really good if we can be as discursive as possible. Um, uh, we've disabled, I think, the Q&A function, but chat's completely available for you to use. Uh, it would be really good if you use that, or, or, or as Chris says, just dip in. Totally fine. Either way, I'm very happy just to have that discussion. Um, those of you that don't know me, a quick bit of my background. So um, I have been um, in the sort of place making, place professionals game for about 20 years now. Um, I had a, a sort of background in working in London, but I now work all over the country to support all sorts of different places and particularly in sort of recovery from COVID at the moment. Um, I've got uh, interest particularly in local economies. Um, in I've, I used to run a a successful street food market. Um, I worked quite a lot in neighbourhood planning, so those of you that understand and that uh, prepared neighbourhood plans, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and also I'm on the Government High Streets Task Force, which is really about um, helping high streets across the UK recover. Um, so we've done the housekeeping. Um, we're gonna, yeah, there's gonna be particular times when we ask you to pitch in uh, those particular things, but as I say, just jump in as you uh, want. Um, the agenda for today, um, uh, so I'm just gonna talk, talk about uh, places in general and five things I've learnt in my experience from uh, places. Um, and then I want to do, do a bit of a recap of the vital and viable work that we did um, through the Institute for Place Management last year. I'm not actually here in that capacity this time, um, but certainly what we're trying to do is follow on from that vital and viable work, particularly as we're looking um, at that sort of COVID recovery, that economic recovery for place. Um, then we're going to look at um, some of the sort of stats around coronavirus and what's changed, um, how other places are managing uh, recovery, uh, we'll ask you a few questions about um, how you, you, your, your sort of personal shopping habits and, and how people are doing in the town, um, some of the barriers to success, um, and then the action planning process itself. So, so the output of this is a very, very quick and dirty, you know, where I spoke to as many people as I possibly can, and these are the things that I think can be achievable. Um, I'm really hoping that it's not going to be too controversial. Um, maybe a bit of controversy isn't such a bad thing, but the idea is that we have a discussion about what isn't and isn't achievable. This isn't the only one I'm doing. I'm also looking at Biddeford and I'm uh, also looking at Holsworthy. So, um, so um, there, there will be some similarities and differences. Um, so just before we get started, does anybody want to pitch in, say anything, uh, or, or, or should I just dive on in? Um, also, Chris, if you can monitor the, who's got hands up and stuff and just stop me if people have got hands up because I can't actually see that. Go on, John. I'm just wondering if we've got a time scale for this meeting because if we haven't, it could go on forever. And all. We're running until 8 o'clock. 8. 8 is our absolute maximum, John, but we're hoping to get out before then. Perfect. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, so just, yeah, I just wanted to talk... Uh, uh, talk about places in general and five things that I've learned about places that, that might help the discussion a little bit um, and just to frame it. Um, the first one, uh, and, and I think you know, it's, it's quite an important one, is that, is that all, all places, all towns are unique. Um, and I think one of the things that we have seen recently, well certainly over the last 20 years, is this idea of the clone town, the idea that um, 
where, where basically every place started to look the same from, from the 1990s. There's a lot of expansion aggressively into places, lots of chains uh, all appearing in the same sort of places and, and sort of a risk aversion on the part of landlords. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's been really interesting to note about uh, the towns of North Devon is that they've been quite shielded by that. Um, we've seen um, some signs that uh, the independents are a lot more are being a lot more supported these days. Um, and really, where where uh, there were too many chains, people weren't being attracted into town centres. So actually, uniqueness is a is is a really really important thing for places, and it's it's something that I've totally seen across the board in North Devon. Um, I think also where you have places that all look the same, that's really driving people to out of town places, driving people to internet shopping. So um, this resurgence of the in independence is really, really important. Um, I think it's not, when I talk about uniqueness, it doesn't just come from shopping as well. I think places are becoming more attractive because of a whole range of activities. So things like events and festivals, markets, I was talking about before, the evening economy, you can you can provide your place with a sense of uniqueness using all sorts of different techniques and providing all sorts of different amenities um, and I, i'm sort of seeing that wherever i go is that that that's sort of really helping places uh, get better um, the second thing is is this idea that change is inevitable and necessary and i think it's, i've seen a lot of places lose their way particularly places that were very associated with particular kinds of industry or activities and, and those those then started to decline um, i think it, it's it's really, really important that, that people understand that where places feel like nothing ever changes, actually places are always in flux. And I think some people that I've spoken to in, 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 the, in the, the towns I've visited in North Devon so far, um, you know, they sort of say the town's going to survive and they're absolutely right. Um, I think the issue is really that change is going to be necessary for the town to be sort of sustainable in the long term. And that's sort of why I'm uh, I'm doing the job that I'm doing. Um, if if it's just left to its own devices, actually, what we'll see is a sort of slow economic decline, particularly around retail. And although you don't have to do anything about that, it just means fewer jobs for younger people, fewer amenities for you as townsfolk. Um, and and you know, sort of without a plan, it just means. You know, there's, there's there's no sort of there's no focus on where you're headed as a place, and I think that's quite important. So time for a bit of change, and that's sort of what the plan's about. Um, the the third thing is this, this uh, John F. Kennedy quote. It's, it's really about illustrating the importance of collective action and personal responsibility. And I know that the people here are, in a sense, kind of self-selecting in the sense that you all work really hard to bring about change in your places. Um, and I think it, 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 as much as possible, if people can be encouraged to, to think about what they can do rather than how they can be, how they can be um, uh, sort of supported by others, um, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, I guess what I'm saying is the places that I've seen really change over time are the ones where people have really sort of stepped up and made those changes themselves. And I know that somewhere like Torrington is, it, it's sort of, fantastically supported by a great volunteer network and you can sort of only do so much um, but I suppose what will go in the action plan is a real mixture of the sort of infrastructure projects that, that the council can do but also some of those things that can happen locally um, at your behest. Um, I think in a, it's, this is sort of connected but there's this whole idea that not not everyone cares about where they live um, and, and, and and that's that's okay and I think again, those people that, that are on this call, you know, they again they're sort of they are, they're very clear that they care about the places, but you shouldn't beat yourself up, I suppose, if you're not able to convince absolutely everybody to get involved in in the place. Um, and you know, as much as we would like that to be the case, you know, people can be quite self-interested in it at, at, at times, and it, sometimes it's not, you know, it's not, it's not everyone all, all working together. It's been a, a real learning curve for me to understand that in, in my job. But just you know, this isn't people are busy. There's all sorts of reasons they can't um, get involved. Um, and then the the last one is is that, that the whole thing that you can absolutely do nothing if you want to. Um, and and I think 
there are you know there are all sorts of things to learn from places that that, that sort of choose not not to create a plan and there's all sorts of things around you know sort of half day closing that happens in in different places and and some people just don't don't want to swap you know their wednesday afternoon just for that additional bit of profit and 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 that's also okay and we see that happening in a lot of different places but i guess the, the point is that if we're trying to link that idea of demand and supply you know for tourists for locals uh, for all sorts of different people that are coming into the town and um we have to have quite frank conversations with uh, with with ourselves about you know where the plan is and what the plan is to sort of meet those needs um now if i could just if, before we just open it up a bit i just wanted to recap what we learned last year so we did this swot analysis um strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats and i just wanted to concentrate specifically on the opportunities because what what we want to do in this call and in the action plan is really focus on on the future rather than talk about the problems of the past so um, just to run through them really quickly, in terms of opportunities, there's this whole idea in, in, in Torrington that, that there needs to be a, mu a much more sort of joined up approach, particularly physically, between the different amenities and assets you've got, some of which are slightly out of town. So in Rosemore, the Parker Trail, the Commons, um, you know, these ideas of trails and sculptures around the town, I think is, is a really interesting one something that may uh, may or may not still be um, really important as we come out of um, out of lockdown again you know that idea of capitalizing on volunteers um, you know really strong volunteer network um, I think capitalizing is one word celebrating is another you know they're not just a sort of endless immunity that they, that they can sort of be drained dry and I know that some of you might feel like that yourselves where you know everything always feels like it's left up to you if there's a really strong volunteer network, it's something that can also be built on uh, and something that can really make a, make a change um, uh, for, for Torrington. Um, this idea of and has anyone got any, um, like, I know we've got a lot of people with a lot of opinions here. Um, very keen to hear from people as well. So these if I were. Could just say, uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt because I've just got one more slide, which is the rest of the opportunities, and then we're going oh, to be even throwing more open if that's all right. Absolutely. So many opportunities. Um, so, yeah, so there's this idea of the common vision, and then uh, we've talked about, I know that that's controversial, but that idea of shared space and pedestrianisation. And then all of these, you can read them for yourself. And I know that you'll be asking who organises these things and how does this work. Um, but, uh, but, this is the list, basically. And the question that I want to ask you now is, is this list still correct? Um, particularly as sort of economically, things have changed quite a lot in Torrington. Um, what else is lacking in the town? You know, has things changed in that, in that respect? And then thirdly, is there anything that you think needs to change for the town to thrive sort of going forward into the future? So that, brings us to the first bit where we open it up to you. Does anybody have any thoughts? Would you like to raise your hand? Karen. Can we just say, um, Ben, um, since January, in fact, we are very much in embryonic stages, but the Town Council is launching in a marketing working group. And we've got our first meeting on the 30th of September. And really with, with that, we're looking at, um, we're looking at the environment, heritage, culture, independent shop, and sport and leisure. And I think one of the quick wins, it won't be quick because there's, you know, nothing's that quick, but we're looking at maps. You know, we have no maps of trails, we have no maps of um, walks, we have very, you know, so again, there's some stuff we can do quite relatively quickly. And on another note, is it, I was having an interesting discussion today with somebody about the changing work practices nationally. Yes. And, and one of the things we were talking about is that, you know, people who always had to live near cities may not need to live near cities to be able to work. And the, the property prices down here are relatively cheap compared to if you're buying a property in Aldershot. My friend's about to sell hers for about four, no, about two, twice as much as you get down here for the same. So, you know, there's sort of one eye on the future in that very much of, you know, 
hot off the press is that the changing work culture that we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, uh, in sort of come, come forth now post COVID could actually also significantly affect demographics as well of the town. And how they will that daytime population, that sort of to have that daytime spend in the town really can change things. And, and actually, when I've been to see some of the uh, estate agents in some of the other North Devon towns, I didn't manage to actually find one in, in, in Torrington. But they said that they've been, they've had lots of um, inquiries from people from much further afield than they ordinarily would, the people looking to move into North Devon. So I think you're absolutely right, Karen. That's, that's sort of like on the cusp of the wave, isn't it, really? That's sort of happened since January. Yeah, yeah. Whole, you know that's a national picture so it's just sort of those things but the marketing group we're meeting for the first time in a couple of weeks and i would imagine we're inviting people onto that group anyone who's got an interest in any of those particular areas we're, we're really looking for skill base um so yeah so we're hoping that that could sort of help with some of these issues that maybe we're going to discuss as we go forward that's, this as well that's, that's really exciting thanks john you had a comment indeed i do um I'm aware that most of the people who work hard for Torrington, in Torrington, are probably already there doing it. Uh, most of us are, not unsurprisingly, quite weary from having thrown our weight behind doing quite a lot of things in Torrington over the years. Uh, and we see the same faces on a constant basis leading these groups. And it's the leading of the groups that we are short of people to actually cover that ground. Uh, I think it'll help. It would help everybody. The, the one thing that is always outstanding is the investment part. We all have great ideas and we all have thoughts of what we can do with it, but none of this will ever be ha happening because it's not predicated on the fact we actually get an investment to actually push them forward. Uh, and I think a lot of people are, are a little bit wary of trying to get involved in these things because they don't know how to get the money. A, and they don't know if there's any money available and not, not many people will also understand where that money is going to come from either and it's always been the biggest problem is how to get your hands on some of the money and quite simply the entire of Torrington could do with just somebody who just fills out funding forms the entire time and can actually relate to the issues that the leaders for want of a better word take to the table and seek out the funding that is necessary to actually think, build on the base. John, can I come in at this point? I think the crucial point is that funders don't fund projects that aren't part of a strategic picture. Um, and so if we're just talking about disjointed, something here, something there, they're not going to buy in. We need, and this is part of why we need to be doing these um, workshops to make sure that actually we are drawing more people in, we are listening to more people, that we're getting more engagement and not just having the same people who feel, oh, wow, was I that strongly worded? Um, uh, but we do need to make sure that we've got more people so that people don't feel, well, it's just going to be the same old, same old. Um, and that might mean doing the occasional radical thing and trying things out, but that has to be based on conversations like this. Anyway, um, any other thoughts uh, on some of those opportunities that uh, Ben shared? Richard. Just a quick one. I, I think the, pedest the um, pedestrianisation of, of the, the main square from, you know, at certain times during the day allowing for deliveries and things could be, could be really positive. I just think it's, it's got mileage. Richard, I'm not meaning to put you on the spot, feel free to not answer this, um, but from a plough perspective, if, say, there was pedestrianisation after 2pm on a Saturday, would that create an opportunity for the plough? Uh, yeah, possibly. It might mean that if, if, we, if we have the cafe back open by then and we've got a busy live event in the evening and it's summer, that we could offer food outside on the street. You know? and, I mean, it's interesting the, the way, you know, under COVID, isn't it? It's inter interesting seeing cafes and restaurants um, and the way they've sort of basically taken over the roads. I, I was in Aberystwyth last couple of weeks ago and they closed off the whole city centre and, and had sort of uh, council stewards making sure that people you know, didn't sort of drive up those roads and all the restaurants and cafes just spread out onto the road. And, and, and I, I remember walking around thinking that this could stick, you know, because it didn't seem to be an issue at all. And they, they reopened the road strangely at six o'clock in the evening, but during the day, or between 10 and six, they were actually 
the main streets in Aberystwyth were all closed and all the cafes and restaurants spread out into the road and it was a it did have a genuine kind of continental feel it was great I think my perspective is very much um and this is very much a conversation starter rather than a conversation end that the the time of the year that people in Torrington love most is Mayfair which is the time of year that we shut the square off and allow people to actually kind of enjoy that square in a safe um, environment. I think we know that it's not necessarily going to work all day, every day, but is it, what do people think about kind of opportunities to experiment around that? Uh, I, I can see John's hand up. I'm keen to hear from some other people as well, but we'll go, for, we'll go f f for John to start out with. Um, I've always threatened the fact that pedestrianization, pedestrianizing Torrington is something that need to be baby steps, but it's something that we really should look at sensibly on a time scale that'll work for the community mm -hmm. and the businesses, uh, and, and, and to see if there's any common ground. I fully appreciate the issues in business and how they will see pedestrianisation, but I don't think it's and until we try it as a trial, we're going to find ourselves unable to actually visualise what the outcome is going to be. Exactly. Uh, innovation based on experimentation, creating uh, data and response. Fantastic. Right. Uh, Councillor Bright, welcome. Um, I'm hoping this is suggesting that uh, CNR has finished before seven o'clock, which is a very positive sign. Um, any other thoughts or comments on that? Ah, Jill. Uh, I'm just checking I'm not muted yet. No, you're coming through loud and clear. Um, I think the, I mean, the, when we talk about pedestrianisation, there is quite a bit of negativity comes across, but I think one of the things we could do is trial it and maybe even just have one night a week where we start with sort of baby steps regarding pedestrianisation. I was sitting in the square on Friday doing a footfall and somebody came up and said, I don't know why we don't have this square pedestrianised and then people can sit out and have coffees and stuff. And, uh, and I said, yeah, you know, we've, we've sort of mooted it, but it's, there's not that, it doesn't seem to be that many people in favour at the minute and they were adamant that they thought it was a great idea so I think there is a bit of a mixture so maybe if we trial it and then perhaps think about having maybe one night or afternoon and early evening with perhaps if there's a big plough event on where we do do that that might work. Well I mean I, I wonder Richard if we have a, a conversation at some point about whether there could be an outdoor event at some point in the next couple of months we'll ask the community what they feel uh, and see what can be done. But we can carry that one on as a side conversation. Charlotte, were you waving your hand there? I was. Um, hi, Chris. I just wanted to... One of the problems that we have in Torrington is that there's nowhere to actually eat in the evening. Um, and obviously Richard suggested that maybe, you know, once the plough reopens, maybe that might be a possibility. Um, but that would be the biggest draw, I think, for most people to actually want to come in and spend time in a pedestrianised area is to be able to eat out. But there's a lot of, of, you know, closures at the moment, like the Black Horse is now closed. Obviously, the cafes generally aren't open in town at the moment. Um, so I think we need to try and think about how we could draw people in from a food perspective, perhaps. I, I would agree um, wholeheartedly. Um, I would also encourage people to note that in the chat function, I've put up a web link, um, which starts with where well, bit.ly forward slash the globe torrington um, is case sensitive uh, so this is an online form that i launched earlier today basically asking people's thoughts about the proposals that have come forward from torridge great torrington town council petrock and the plough arts center to bring forward a community acquisition of the globe and it's points like that charlotte about the fact that we do need a stronger nighttime economy. We do need jobs, which were mentioned earlier by Ben, to actually get the town centre moving and more importantly, working for as many parts of our community as possible. So yeah, so if we can all complete that one and share it to everyone we can think of, then that would be hugely appreciated, please. Okay, right. I think I'm gonna hand back to Ben. 
Yeah. All right. Hey, do, uh, does anybody have any further thoughts they want to raise? So just, at this just to say that to bring people in, you, as well as you need the places open to be able to have a continental coffee or something to eat. You know, what, what about something like a film night? You know, you have an outdoor film night. I don't know, but we do need something going on if we're going to try breaking ground and experimenting. I think it's good to, we've got to experiment in some shape or form, but it's a balance between, and that's where, you know, we need the Chamber of Trade involved in this or the, you know, the businesses around the square as well. But I'm sure there's room to, for the two to run together. Is it fair to say that, that there, there aren't any particular downsides to pedestrianisation after a certain point in the day? It, I mean, most of the businesses are closed by what? Five at the latest? Mm -hmm. Five, yes. half five, I think is the latest yep. for one of them, yeah. Okay. So it would be possible for us to consider doing all sorts of different things in the evening. It's just a question of who organises them, I suppose. Yeah, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the evenings it goes, I mean, Councillor Clayton's been doing some football and it was quite surprising how many people were still walking through the town, even though the shops weren't open. So I think, yeah, I think there's... Okay, to I'm aware. Over to um, John Burrell, please. So, hi, guys. As a, a, a newcomer to the town... And Welcome. Uh, we moved here a year ago. I think it's a fabulous place. I absolutely love it. I moved from West Yorkshire, so quite the distance. I think the town square is such an asset I mean, it's in lots of other towns that it's just crying out for some level of pedestrianisation, not all the time, but certainly evenings or a weekend or special events. It just uh, makes me, my heart believe that it doesn't happen. But we've lived in unusual times at the moment, but please do it. It's just great. Uh, that, that, that could be one of the quotes of the evening, John. Do we have anybody on the call who who is absolutely just completely against it in, in one way or another. I want to venture to put their hand up. No? That, I mean, that's good. I and mean, that's a bit of a vote of confidence that something might be tried. Um, but it sounds to me as though, certainly talking to businesses, that it needs to be very, very sensitively done. And I think the baby steps is absolutely, is absolutely right in that case. Um, right, let me move on. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what has happened with coronavirus and how things have been changed over, over, the, over the time that we've been um, working on this, this project. Um, so obviously this is not a, a, a picture that's particularly surprising. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of store closures over the time. Interestingly, um, working in Torrington, it doesn't feel like too much is closed, although certainly evening economy has done slightly bucking the trend, but evening economy has done slightly worse than the shops. Um, but when it comes to um, job losses in the shops, um, you can see that uh, over time, uh, that the uh, sort of project projected job losses uh, and also store closures were going up actually what, what predicted um, for 2020, so 2018, 117,000 job losses, predicted now 235 in 2020. I think that's actually uh, pretty um, likely to be quite a conservative estimate um, for, for 2020. Um, I think also one of the things that we haven't, we, we sort of don't understand yet, looks like Eat Out to Help Out has been a, an enormous success nationally. Um, one of the things we haven't seen yet is sort of as furlough comes to an end, it might be that we might not see too many store closures but we will certainly see redundancies and there's questions over that again questions to ask over what that means for Torrington it feels to me as though it's been quite uh, resilient over time uh, but let's see what happens and um, just in terms of the sort of main factors that I think particularly will also affect uh, Torrington I mean hospitality in terms of, I mean, I know that you don't have hotels, which is part, partly the sort of big drive behind um, uh, behind the globe. Um, but hospitality has been in trouble for, for quite a long time, and particularly due to sort of spiralling uh, 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 rent, uh, labour shortages, that sort of thing. So when it comes to designing what happens uh, with the globe, uh, you need to think very carefully about how you know how that will be structured, who will work there. 
um, and what are the sort of broader activities that can go around it. And I'm, I'm thinking particularly, you know, there, there, are, there are several um, sort of main assets in the town. There's the plough, there's the globe, there's the community hall. Um, and I think a sort of concerted plan for those to work together would be quite important actually for their uh, assured success. Um, social infrastructure is another really interesting one. Um, it, it would appear that there's going to be a lot less money to help um, cope with some of the, you know, the issues, adult social care, homelessness, that have really um, raised their heads over the last few months. But at the same time, we're seeing a bit of a resurgence in the notion of community. And I know that you've seen it locally. We've certainly seen it nationally too, with some really big initiatives that are, that, that are really getting off the ground locally for people to help each other, even if it's just knocking on your neighbour's door, somebody that's shielding, somebody that's vulnerable, and just, just sort of helping them out. Um, Karen, you were talking before about that, that change in work patterns. Um, I think you're absolutely right with that one. You've got a lot more people working from home uh, uh, in, in, a place, in all places in, in the UK, from the smallest towns uh, to the biggest suburbs. Um, it will be very, very interesting to understand how particularly as companies become more cash strapped over time. If offices are downsized, what could that mean for our communities? Will people be working from home? Actually, will there be more local work hubs, uh, so places in town that people can work? What does that mean in terms of, you know, local economy, sandwich shops, things that will support that sort of, um, uh, that use in town centres? Um, there will be interesting changes to the, the population. Um, uh, I mean, maybe a bit less so in terms of North Devon, but we will see changes to the population as a result of COVID, both at the high and the low end, uh, the older and the younger end, I should say. And then finally, I mean, North Devon, certainly tourism is, is, is a key part of the economy. It's not the only part of the economy, but North Devon is pretty much dependent on a functioning tour, uh, airline industry and tourism for quite a lot of its jobs. Um, be really interesting to understand and you know I hope not too tragic but interesting to understand what the loss of the 2020 season is going to look like um, whether businesses will be lost as a result now I've seen certainly in uh, a number of places that I've been working in that the summer season with the vacationers um, has been a lot more successful than, than maybe some anticipated so some of your thoughts on that and, and how, and I know you don't have tons of tourists, but some of your thoughts on how things have been working in that respect uh, would be interesting to make after this section. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how places are managing recovery, because there are some ideas in here that might help you a little bit. Um, so places like uh, Kendall, North Allerton, um, Saltaire, they're doing some quite interesting stuff around the virtual high street. Um, there are apps now available um, in places that, that have, you know, shopping centres um, or, or, or high streets, which essentially just take that high street online, enable you to be able to click and collect. So uh, if, a, if there are a number of different shops that are participating in it, then you would be able to order your shopping online. Um, and then you'd be able to, it, that would essentially be, be delivered to you, or you could just, um, sorry, Chris, I see your hand up. That's I, right, I, I, I was going to say, you on the um, edge, so I don't, I that's okay. I was going to, um, Felicity's joined just at exactly the right time. Um, I'm late. I, could, I couldn't get on to the... Don't worry at all. Um, but it'd be great to Hi, get Chris, you... Ben, nice to see you. Your, Hi, um, <laughs> it'd be great to get um, you and Angie's opinion on something like this. So, um, Shop Appy, uh, as... Ben said, um, is something that actually we've been looking into along with a couple of other platforms. And effectively, it's uh, a site or an app that brings together all of the stores in Torrington, as an example. Um, so you could all have an online presence through this app. So anyone in the local community knows, right, I want to buy something locally, online, um, from Torrington. Mm -hmm. And it creates an online store for all of you. Some of the uh, options enable you to then create a central place for people to come into the town and then collect 
all of their order from various different shops in one foul swoop. Does that sound interesting? Does that sound convoluted? What would your initial thoughts be? Um, Karen, just to jump in there, Karen, it's also okay. probably worth you, you knowing that, um, I mean, they're, they're, they've all got slightly different uh, focuses. And Loyal Free is really good on trails and sort of, it does really interesting things around sort of tourism and, you know, getting people to understand the heritage of the town as well as that sort of retail side of things. So, so they've all got slightly different um, focuses. Oh, there is Karen. Yeah. Felicity, Ange, any thoughts on that kind of uh, an opportunity? I mean, the, I think for our business, which, you know, if somebody wants to pick up a, I don't know, a, massive great chest of drawers or something and obviously there's sort of logistical you know difficulties around that mm -hmm. um, but would it be useful for for example um to have a place where as a new item of um sort of comes into the the shop that you could very yeah. simply post it onto this uh, portal anyone in torrington could have a look through and go oh yeah you know what i really like that or would you fear that people would have a look on the online portal and then go, oh, actually, I don't need to come into to the shop to browse. Yeah, I mean, I think our shop in particular is a browser, mm. a browsy place. Um, you don't know what's there, sort of, and to photograph things, crikey, that would be a, a full-time job in itself, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Joe... Um, my other half does a lot mm. of that with Facebook anyway. Um, so yeah, every week so. we put a, fa a Facebook post on to show what new stock's in. Um, if people, we have a lot of um, people that sell through us. So we update their, the things that they've been doing and making and creating as well. Um, so we, we sort of do that every week anyway. Um, um, I mean, I think if it, as, think as Felicity said, it, because of the kind of things that we, we sell in a way, we sell kind sort of similar things in the sense that, you know, we do do big furniture, but we do small gifts as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we've done some posting of gifts during coronavirus. Um, but other than that, uh, we do a lot of deliveries. <laughs> you yeah. know, people come in and buy a table, we deliver yeah. it. So, um, it, it sort of, it might work for some of the shops, but I don't think it would work for all of them. It is, I think, what we're kind of coming to. Oh, um, and I completely agree. It's, it's the interesting thing about, so we've got various different people who are uh, like yourselves selling through Facebook. It's then a case of, right, well, how do we make sure, uh, and it, this could be a solution, it might not be, I'm not certain myself. Um, how do we make sure that everyone from across Torrington can find one place to find all of the the people who are selling rather than going right I need right. to go over here to find that person yeah uh, they're on Facebook but I'm going to find someone else who's on Etsy uh, and someone else is selling through Instagram and and it's that variety of platforms that then creates the potential confusion um yeah I see what you mean yeah so, yeah um yeah so somewhere that, that you can just go to one place and from there you can see that there's this there's this there's this there's this absolutely and then you might decide okay i'll go and have a look there um yeah that, i mean that that would work whether or not being able to sell through that particular portal would be a possibly over complicate things but maybe it could be just to provide the information again this is where um, it's best to have these conversations and we find the right yeah. things eventually so okay yeah, karen, yeah. karen shifting to you and then i'm aware that mr ashelford yeah, is probably going to say to me when, when i when i saw when you said about the virtual high street you know the, the, the estate agents are doing virtual viewings right now mm -hmm. well i was sort of thinking because what we've done the last we're going to do it again in october we've got a list of all the different types of businesses that are in the town that go out and crier Mm -hmm. but I was thinking something like, could you do a quick, snappy, like virtual visual tour of the, the town? I mean, if you if you if you if you focus into collectability, it gives you a, a straight away a vision of what that shop's got, and it's packed with lovely things. If you and whether or not you could then make that quick and snappy, 
the tour of Great Torrington. This is what's these are these are the shops that are on offer, but visually rather than just listing the different shops. Karen, if it was interesting, I could have a uh, we have a local. Um, and very and young, dynamic, excellent, um, 360 degree photographer um, who's just taken some amazing footage of uh, our future High Street Fund site in Biddeford, who does actually offer a very, very, very reasonable rate to come round um, to retail. Um, so it's one of the, one of the things we're looking at. That is, kind of route, for example. Because one of the things we're looking at is a town map anyway, maybe local artists listing yeah. the shop. But, if you can visually see what's in the shop, you know, the, 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 the shop is it 11, eight, no, is it 11? No, the one in the market, <laughs> it's all the different numbers, sorry. Um, I mean, you just got to look in that and it takes your attention straight away because there's lots of things in there. So if you could just snapshot each shop and business that there is in Torrington, that would be, you know, an opportunity for people to do a virtual tour of what's available in the town centre and the Pally Market. Just, just an idea really, but it'd be interesting, Chris, the details of that person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hamish has been working on it, but he's um, unfortunately off at the moment. So, yeah. uh, Felicity, I'm going to come to you in a sec. I'm aware right. that Mr. Ashelford uh, has got his hand up, and I'm guessing he's going to talk about the One Torrington website. Even though that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to come on to. So we launched the One Great Torrington UK website back at the beginning of June, um, and that has got the opportunity for shops and local groups and societies etc to put their listing online they can upload photos of their shop and their wares or whatever they might be doing um, so the opportunity is there we could with a small pot of money expand that to include the virtual tours which i know karen has referred to and others so mm -hmm. there is scope to build on that website um, as we venture into the future okay would it be possible to get uh people's kind of as we said at the moment we've got people selling through facebook through etsy through all sorts of channels um is that something that at the moment you've been pushing people to provide as well um yeah so each each um listing will have obviously the contact details the description photos and links to social media whichever platform they might be on any or all fantastic ian just for those people who haven't come across the site could i ask you to please just put that into the chat as well so that anyone yep. can access that uh, Ian, just so you're aware this, uh, it is being recorded as well so these kind of things hopefully can get out to as many people as possible uh, moving forward right well that was an interesting discussion um any final comments on that one before we hand back to ben again richard go on um, it might seem kind of counterintuitive that we could do things online, but we, we are thinking as part of social distancing, if we can reopen with limited audiences for live events within the plough for, and, and for films that, that well, uh, maybe for live events, we could stream them at the same time. So we're mm -hmm. looking to try and get capital funds to, to get the cameras and so on and, and the extra technical expertise so that people who don't want to risk it, in inverted commas, could stay at home and, uh, and perhaps order some food from takeaways in Torrington, et cetera, et cetera. It could be linked to it. Or, um, and, and a small audience will pay to, uh, to risk it and watch it live within the plough. You mean to enjoy the atmosphere of the wonderful Plough Arts Centre? Indeed. Absolutely. Okay. No, I mean, it, it does sound counterintuitive to a certain uh, extent, but we all know that we need to be looking at different opportunities and diversify, and it's the places that are diversifying that have been the ones that are successful. I think Torrington's already shown a great example of that with the town hall um, taking on the Sunday lunches and the steak nights from the Black Horse to just make the most of opportunities. So it's, it's where we look creatively that we're going to be successful. Mm. Okay. Councillor Bright, you have your hand up. I think it was I'm going to be for the one Great Torrington website, wasn't it, Chris? Oh, yes, yeah. So, yeah, I was going yeah. to... Uh, however, <laughs> it, it, it will come as no surprise, Mr. John Eels. Uh, is that hand waft, wafting around again? I'm sorry. I, no need for apologies. Opinions are great. I'm just aware that uh, actually, uh, from what we see, what I'm seeing from within town, uh, Torrington has actually braved the COVID uh, crisis remarkably well with its you know the, the shopping that's been done in town i have never seen town fuller on some of the days i've been in town i mean it literally has been heaving and this hasn't all just been you know people from 
holiday home somewhere else. This has been locals actually bothering to shop in town and finding town and actually buying their wares from town. Uh, and that's no pun included. Um, it's just a case of, you know, if you look back six months, everybody drove to Morrison's and that was the end of life. They don't drive by the Morrison's now. They come into the town and they actually are spending a lot of money, certainly on the groceries, uh, where they weren't before. I, I, I can't help knowing what goes on in the collections area and the antiques and whatever. I'm hoping they picked up a bit of business. But from the outside looking in, and that's just the outside slightly looking in, uh, I would sense that actually Torrington has held up better than it was before. Not even as well, but actually better. And that's all I say. People who may be able to tell me otherwise. I think one of the things that, that people described to me as I, was, as I was walking around town when I came to visit was that, that there's quite a number of people that do their shopping by coming into town and just going between maybe five or six shops and they've got you know the bakery and news agent and they do that sort of circuit which is a bit like how Parisians shop when you know they're like they shop on a sort of almost like a daily basis and uh, we've seen a resurgence of that nationally actually in, in, in terms of how people shop and, and you're, you're absolutely right John you know it used to be much more, more focused on the, on the supermarket but now as we've started supporting those independents that's formed this new habit in people and so in many ways that's why this sort of shop appy or vir virtual high street thing where you can go between all of these different places virtually and, and order everything and just pick up in one place is certainly an idea and if not that then maybe there are ways in which we can encourage others to pick up that habit which essentially is supporting all of those different independent traders Ben, the other point about that is that's good for cutting down on food waste. Uh, I'm aware that, uh, Ian, your hand is up still. Is that from the website comment earlier? Yep, unintentionally, hand going down. No worries. Okay. All right, so let's look at some other things. So, so I mean, these are slightly, this is Manchester, actually, so don't, you know, don't worry, you don't have to be Manchester. But uh, there's been a lot of really interesting campaigns. Again, uh, Karen, I'm thinking back to your uh, marketing group, uh, you know, if you think quite carefully about your messaging and your audience, I think that's a really, really good start. You know, it's, it's uh, great to have trails, but it's like, who are they aimed at? What do they want to learn? What do they want to know? Um, is, is, is some interesting work that you can do around that sort of stuff. But this is very bright and, uh, and welcoming imagery from Manchester there. Um, uh, Oz Street has done some really interesting work on vacant shops. Now, you don't have loads of vacant shops, it's fair to say, um, but those that you do, so just, just um, as, as an example, what Oz Street is doing, um, it's launched a thing called F Future Oz Street, um, and it's, it's the Town Council Local Business Improvement District, and they've got a £700,000 grant um, from central government, I think it is. Um, and they're basically using that to do up uh, shop fronts to really sort of, you know, spruce up the town a little bit and to use that as use those, those shops as meanwhile space for new businesses. And I'm sort of quite struck by uh, Torrington as a place that has um, some young people, some of them may want to start a business, but really sort of need the support to be able to do that. Maybe if there are, um, you know, places in town that might support that sort of use consider. Um, I talked to you before about local work hubs, so again this is about taking vacant space but it doesn't need to be shops, it can be above shops or anywhere really and I know that there's uh, consideration in, uh, in, in the plans for, for the globe to do something around this as well, is using that daytime uh, you know, work from home po population to um, essentially prop up the economy of the town so they're not just sat at home they're also coming in, you know, if, you're, if there's an ability to be able to socially distance, but also to interact economically, which is really important with each other and with the town in general. For those people that have been working from home, um, if you've got kids, I massively sympathise for you. It can't have been easy. Not everyone is going to be able to do that forever. So if, you're, if you find that your employer shuts the office, for some, for some places, these things are going to be really, really important if those, if those employers downsize. Um, Bill Grimsey, who used to be the CEO, oh no, sorry, let's, I, it, this is just a thing about community wealth building, which is just, 
Um, it's just it's something that's happening in Preston. It's the most uh, famous example of it. And basically, it's just this idea that you take any of the money that's being generated locally and you keep it as local as possible. And the Preston model works on these four different uh, metrics. The first, the first is essentially harnessing the power of of, of your all of your anchor institutions to make sure that if they're buying anything, they're buying it locally, goods and services, localizing that spend. The second is about the workforce and where, you know, this is really good, particularly for local authorities, uh, but where you've got a workforce that's, that's, that you can sort of support, it's really about making sure that they're skilled uh, and like properly skilled up you know they're paid correctly um, and then they are encouraged to spend locally um, and save locally with credit unions and that sort of thing. Um, the third is around land property investment so again with those anchor institutions, local authorities, how are they, and we're seeing this absolutely in Biddeford, um, uh, you know how are you using your land, how are you acquiring land to make sure that the economy um, keeps as much wealth as possible local um, and then finally, this idea of uh, economic uh, democracy, um, which is, it's about, it's about governance, basically. So, you know, what, what you can set up in governance terms that help you uh, give your citizens greater investment in your economic future. Um, so that, so there, there can be a lot more uh, de uh, uh, detail that I can send you on the Preston model, but it's really, really one to consider. Um, Bill Grimsley, I was just going to say very quickly, he's he's developed something called uh, Build Back Better, which is his sort of recovery plan um, for towns and cities up and down the country. He's basically said, when I was CEO of Iceland, when I was CEO of Wix, we ruined the high street. We did it not really understanding what we were doing, um, but, you know, sort of mea culpa. And what he's saying is, you now need this massive shift in power away from central government, much more towards local communities, and having this renewed focus on localism, empowering local people, helping them sort of understand how they can design their own places, essentially. Um, it is a fantastic read as well, Ben. I would encourage anyone isn't who's it? interested isn't it? it's just in regeneration. It, it's not an arduous one. Um, no, it's great. It will fill you with hope for the future of your town um, and very much is based along a lot of the conversations that we've been having around... Uh, community at the heart of the, the design around the importance of the environment, the importance of uh, independence, the importance of fun, um, and equally kind of with things like uh, the globe, the importance of community ownership. And leadership. So that's, that's, that's the second one is absolutely um, reinforcing that idea that you people as, as leaders need to be as empowered as you possibly can and I remember, you know, um, so you were saying this before about the, the, you know, the idea that it feels like it's always you, but what you need to be given is the power to be able to inspire others, to be able to help you um, achieve what you need to achieve for your place, particularly with that vision in, in, in mind. And then the third one, um, fewer cars, more green space. Now, I know rural, rural communities are really reliant on the car. Um, certainly, maybe he's talking about the cities a little bit more in terms of that, but uh, um, you know, the commons as an asset for, 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 for Great Torrington, you know, I'm sure that you would agree it is something that would absolutely bring people from far, far away, even if they have to drive there. Um, so looked at work, work hubs and home offices, infrastructure, things around super fast broadband, um, what happens with retail in terms of demand patterns, you know, this is changing in all sorts of different ways. And also, we're talking a little bit before about rural housing and how uh, you know how that's changed as well. Um, let's do our poll, Chris. Can you launch the poll? Fingers crossed. It's like launching a ship, isn't it? Who knows? It's going to work. Okay. There you go. Right. So what we're going to so what we just what I wanted to do do at this point, um, and it's not you know massively representative. Uh, it's just to get an idea about, you know, essentially how personal habits are changing local economies. This is all completely anonymous. We won't see how you voted. But what I'm trying to find out is how many of you shopped online before the pandemic, 
during lockdown and now so to understand about you know whether those habits have been retained i think we can learn a lot from that um and it also tells us about um how those individual behaviors can make a difference right it's all coming in now two of the we need more of you to vote if you can oh. huh? Oh, the votes are coming in thick and fast. Brilliant. Okay. Right, you don't all have to vote. We've got one that hasn't voted. You don't have to vote if you don't want to. Okay, look, let's end the polling. Really useful, thank you. So, right, this is the, uh, I'm just going to share the results here. Um, so, so seventy-five percent of you sh did shop online before the pandemic. Interestingly enough, as far as you're concerned, that went down a bit um, during lockdown. Um, I'd, that'd be interesting to understand if any of you've got any thoughts about why why you you stopped uh, shopping online. And if you did begin shopping online during the pandemic, you have now continued to do so. Um, so that is, is interesting in itself. Has anyone got any thoughts on why their habits changed during lockdown or why they didn't change? No? Oh, John, uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. <laughs> My habit didn't change, but the third question says, if you began shopping online during the pandemic, do you continue to shop? I didn't begin shopping online. I was doing it already. So the third question is not one that's easy to answer. Yes, no, absolutely. You're quite right. So it's it's one of those things that you, yeah, if you if you were already shopping online anyway, or you'd never have shopped online, then, then that answer is different. Um, Adrian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. I think the um, I did um and ah about the, uh, the second question, um, in question really about where it dropped a little bit. We had in, in my in my household um, because of lockdown. Um, my my wife, for example, couldn't couldn't therefore work as being being self employed. Um, so we had to dramatically tighten the purse strings. So what, from what we did online before the pandemic uh, was really affected during the pandemic. Uh, we're coming slightly coming out the other side now, but. I don't know whether what other people think, but that may be part of the reason why during the pandemic, actually the online shopping um, possibly went down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's really useful. Thank you. Um, Ian, you're on mute. You're yeah, on. I've, I seem to have my hand up from last time, but I can answer anyway. Um, I've, again, I I've, I've was um, similar to Adrian. I was um, at home, working from home in lockdown, and I used to do, well, we still, still shop online, but that seemed to change during lockdown that, in the sense that I suppose I wanted to support the local trades, the baker, the butcher, the, the greengrocer and so on. So my, my thinking is if they look after, if I look after them, they, they'll look after me longer term, that kind of approach. That's really useful. Thank you. I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to remember the actual number of this person's deli and I don't necessarily want to single him out, but one of the um, really, really champion businesses in, uh, in Torrington, that I discovered was the one opposite the South, is it Southside Car Park? The, the, the yeah, deli yeah. place. Yeah, the 37, yeah. Number 37, thank you. Um, where just to see a business adapt to that extent during lockdown to really meet people's needs was, it did, it did brilliantly for his business, it did really well for his customers, and it, there was a real sense in talking to him that, that actually this was a mutually supportive arrangement and I think there's a lot that we learn from that. Um, Ian, do you, your hand is still up, do you, and John, you had your hand up before, didn't you? I did have my hand up um, and I'm just going to just, just note the fact that people might not have spent so much during uh, online during the actual area of Covid because they haven't got anything else to do, i.e. they couldn't do this stuff that you would normally do. Uh, do I want to take my camping gear out? Oh, I better get a new Mac. All of that sort of stopped. Yeah. So there was sort of less to spend your little little bucks on. So it's all it's changed now. You're always you know everybody's gone back to doing what they wanted to do basically. 
but at a time you were restricted to eating food and drinking you couldn't really go anywhere yeah. you couldn't do anything you know you buy a jigsaw now and again but that was about it <laughs> yeah okay let's have a look at the second poll that we've got um let me just launch this so again this is really about um looking at the sort of connections that people have formed and what i'm going to try and do is look at this in the context of sort of national trends and what what's happened so you, you may have seen some of those um interesting studies that uh, that, that were launched that sort of showed how people have changed in terms of their social connections and local connections during the pandemic. So if you could vote in this one, what we're asking is if you were shielding during lockdown, are you still shielding now? And um, most of you very clearly are not shielding. Um, oh, some of you might be. Um, that whole idea around people feeling anxious about returning to the town centre to shop, you know, again, that will have a huge impact on whether people choose to continue to shop online. Um, there's, we've got a question here about uh, whether you've made new social connections, are you volunteering more, do you, have you got to know your neighbours more, maybe this is the sort of place where you, everyone already knew their neighbours, and then finally th this idea of, of about this double-edged sword about, you know, it, the economy needs tourists, but actually, you know, they're coming in from all parts of the country, are they bringing the virus with them, you've been, you've been sort of mercifully um, you've escaped the, as, as much as possible the coronavirus, and so I can imagine there'd be some worry there. Um, we've had eight out of, oh, we've lost one. We've had 10 out of 12 vote, so that's great. Okay, that's brilliant, thank you. So this is the results of that. Uh, okay, so, we, uh, so one of you is still shielding. Um, three of you aren't, 64% didn't shield so some of you didn't shield um interesting that there is still some anxiety about people returning to the town center to shop not not lots i mean we lost john again <laughs> it's coming back um not a lot but it's you know it's it's important that that we recognize that some people are still feeling a bit anxious about about coming back into town uh, 91 percent of you have made new social connections so that's really really interesting to know um if you understand given a town the size of to uh, torrington you know who those so so social connections were was it about more volunteering um what, what what was it and then there's a really interesting even split uh in terms of that and i think there's a, there's a lot i'm so sorry i haven't shared the results um, that that uh, last question really even split. So half of you are concerned about the risk of tourists spreading COVID-19, and the other half of you is basically saying economy needs them. Okay, so there are the results. Has anyone got any anything to say about the new social connections they made and uh, what they think it could mean for sort of social interaction in the place? Or any thoughts on that idea about and about the, the um, it was it was really the the Thursday night clapping that um, was kind of amazing. We we live on Castle Street, which is just off the town square, and um, although it, we know a lot of the neighbours to say hello to, we didn't necessarily know them by name as such. But um, the lady that lives opposite us teaches dance classes and um, there's a, another lady that lives at the top of the street that is part of the silver band so she used to play her trombone every Thursday and then we'd have a massive kind of blast of dance music from Rita and we'd all be out in the street dancing for half an hour and it was it was just a great atmosphere and when we stopped doing that we kind of really missed it but as a result of that we've we sort of talk a lot more to the, the neighbours than we would have done I think um, and we, we all know each other's names now, which we didn't, do. I mean, we've only lived here just over a year and now we know the names of all the people on the street virtually, um, mm -hmm. which we didn't necessarily know before. So that, that was a really good fun experience for us. We really, it, you know, it, it kind of made us feel very much part of the town um, being kind of newbies. Um, so we, we really appreciated that. 
it's so interesting. I did, you know, I, I really think a lot can be built from such humble beginnings in a sense. You know, if you if you understand who around you is more a bit maybe a bit more vulnerable, if you understand, you know, the sort of circumstances of the people around you, then maybe it's, you know, at some point next year you start with a bit of a street party and or, or you, you know, do a bit of volunteering together. There's all sorts of opportunities that can that can come from that. So it's really, really interesting to hear that. Um anyone else have any thoughts about this idea about tourism and, and what and what that means for people's concern. I, I think if I lived in some of the other places that we see on TV, I'd be very concerned. I think because we live where we live, and I think there has been quite a good level of responsibility, I think. So, and I think we're queuing, there's distance, the shops have sort of got their things in, in place. I, I personally haven't, I thought I would feel more unsafe, but I haven't felt more unsafe. Um, but I think there are certain parts, certainly like, in, well, not too far away where I'd be very concerned because of just, the, like we don't have a nightlife really, which we've already discussed, which is, you know, a minus, but one of the plus results of that might be that we haven't had lots of opportunities for people to get together and maybe, you know, feel that they weren't socially distancing as they should which we've seen across the country and other places so I think it's just because we've I think we've the, the traders have done really well in handling that and I think that's given a sense of security really yeah okay um so that's really interesting thank you Karen thanks to everyone that uh, gave, gave gave us some comments there um I we said before right at the start so so this is really about so we understand a little bit about how people are behaving here um but what do you think is missing from what we've said so far? What do you really think is missing in the town that might sort of help to meet those new needs that people have got about, you know, sort of encouraging people to visit the town, maybe in a socially distanced way. Um, but that, and also in more general economic terms, what do you think is missing that will help the town thrive a bit more? Go for it, Jill. Hey. Um, I think that... Oh. Sorry, did you ask me? Yeah, go for it, yes. Jill. Okay, sorry. Um, I think that there are, I've, um, there are visitors coming, but I don't think there's necessarily much for them to do. Um, when, I've been, when I've been sitting in the square, sort of in the um, early evening, there have definitely been groups of visitors walking around, but there's absolutely nothing nothing for them to do there's nothing open there's no nothing really that they can go into and I think during the day again because um because of the because some places are still closed that again if the weather's not so great there's nothing to do I keep sort of accosting people and saying are you a visitor and I um sort of chivvy them towards the view and on towards the commons if the weather's nice so that they know that they can wander around there but there's not a lot else other and not many other places for them to, to go to. Yeah, Could I sorry. just quickly ask, kind of, when you've been doing those um, footfall counts, you say that there's kind of visitors milling around. Would you also say that the same is true for young people, that there's not enough for them to do and that there's a lot of them milling around? Yeah, there are. There's quite a few of them. I've been sitting just outside the town hall and they've been under the town hall chatting and practising dance moves, etc. <laughs> but yeah, there's not a lot for them to do at all either. Mm -hmm. So I think so we've had... We've had visitors to the town and I'm sure they've been spending during the day, but when it gets to sort of tea time, they're having to go because, you know, they're trying to wander around the square, but literally, you know, there have been about five places open. Yeah, I, mean, I think if you look at all the Facebook groups recently, there's been a number of uh, kind of restaurant requests put on there yeah. and it tends to be go to Beeford, go to Biddeford, go to um, Woolsery, rather than there's this great place in central Torrington. Yeah. Anyway, Felicity. I was going to say exactly that about the most common question we get asked is, is there somebody we can, somewhere we can have lunch or is there somewhere we can have an evening meal? You know, where would you recommend for an evening meal? And, and there, in Torrington itself, in the town, there are very few options, if none at all at the moment. Yeah. I just put at Winkley tonight, Saturday night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> John, yeah. John B. One of my big frustrations generally in the area from coming a year ago is that pubs and restaurants tend to stop serving at two o'clock and don't start again until six or seven. 
and I <laughs> don't want to eat lunch at two o'clock necessarily or start at one o'clock. I want to be able to go somewhere at three or four mm. or whenever. And that was a massive frustration for me. There's quite a few nodding heads around the, uh, around the various rooms there. We're effectively saying we want to adopt a continental lifestyle, right? Uh, mm -hmm. well, I, mean, I, I, I don't think it's too much to, to uh, imagine that, uh, you know, there's one place in town that you can go out in the evening. I mean, it, you know, to, the idea that you have to go to the next town is, is quite unusual, actually. Mm -hmm. Find some really good, some, it does need a good restaurant. Not necessarily a high class restaurant, but, you know, good decent food for a good decent price. And I think that's really lacking. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because then there's very clearly demand for it so it's 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 interesting to, to to try to figure out why it's not being met so the black horse was the only that was doing evening meals right mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's currently closed and is there is then there's takeaways aren't there but there aren't any restaurants at all john the, the black horse stopped serving lunch at two o'clock when it was open but it was serving so, dinner as well right oh it served dinner but yeah. You know, that was six or seven o'clock. There was a big void in in the middle. And that's not just Torrington. I found that uh, pretty common around the mm. whole area. Mm. Um, and I don't know of many places I could go to. I uh, one in Instow, um, one at Westwood Ho, and one at Brompton that would be open all day. Mm. Intriguing. And Jenna, you um, waved your hand a second ago. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that we, we went to the Torridge for the Thai last Saturday. Um, and OK, you've got to walk down Mill Street and back up Mill Street. But it was very well organised. Excellent food as always. And yeah, it's it's open in the evenings. Um, so, to yeah. Sit in. Pardon? To eat in? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. He's, got, he's got a lot of space because he's got he's got a small restaurant at the back of the the pub and you know so there's plenty of space and mm. he's organised it very well and yeah the the Thai food there is is stunning so um, it might be the only place to eat in the evening but it's stunning it's worth it <laughs> yeah definitely yeah very glad to hear it okay, okay good um, any other comments on any of that stuff before we move on. Oh, it's uh, Councillor Bright. Councillor Bright. Yeah, um, so obviously we've all identified that the, we don't have enough restaurants that open for the evening. So how do we get them in? That's a very good <laughs> question. I mean, this is market forces, right? I mean, I, I, I would suggest that at some point, if the demand is there, it will be met. So it feels to me as though the circumstances around the Black Horse, I don't entirely understand them, but... Um, but if there is demand there, then new landlords should be found pretty quickly. Um, you, you don't look convinced about that? Uh, well, I think it could be the issue with the people owning the property rather than people wanting to get in there, I would thought. But um, maybe that's a whole different ball game, really. But it... Okay, so if there are circumstances around that, that maybe the town council or somebody else could make uh, representations to those owners I, I don't know I mean I, I just don't know the situation but I guess the I guess the sort of basic point you know maybe the globe at some point as well but the basic point is that if the demand is there then it should be met um, it's it really interesting things happening at the community all about state nights and stuff which would suggest that you know if, if they if they're successful then maybe it's a, something that can be built on I'd also suggest the momentum is important. Um, so people are more reluctant to open a new business where they feel that there's not momentum in a place. So recently in Torrington, we've obviously seen the Black Horse um, stop trading. Um, we've temporarily seen the plow um, not being active and we've, or within kind of the, the usual building. Um, we've obviously got the globe that's shut. And so it's a case of starting to turn some of these significant kind of blocks around. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll start to see some signs um, of the plough being able to open its doors again. Um, we've spoken briefly earlier about the fact that we're trying to explore um, 
creating a, a work hub, so shared workspace within Central Torrington as well. I said today that we have posted uh, online the community engagement survey about the globe to start getting people excited about that project. So it's starting to get people talking positively about Torrington again, rather than just kind of go, oh, well, Torrington, uh, of course, the plough's not there, the black horse, the globe, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's really a case of let's start smiling, being positive and get excited about the future and people will get on board and we need to have these conversations and get people, get people moving forward. Let's talk about moving forward. So I think I said before that what we're doing with this action plan and, you know, there's, there's some time left to contribute to it and contribute ideas to it and everything. But what we're doing with this action plan is really trying to fit in as much as possible with strategic plans above it in the hierarchy. Um, one of which is the North Devon recovery plan. Um, and I know that um, obviously Torres District Council is doing a lot as well as, as are the town council. Um, just in the very short term, um, you know, we've had in the immediate recovery, there's been the grants and I've spoken to a number of businesses that for whom those grants have been real sort of lifesavers over the summer. Um, we've seen some physical changes to town centres. I don't think we've seen loads in Torrington, uh, but uh, generally they're about sort of helping um, uh, hospitality businesses, even economy businesses to sort of spread out a bit where you've got tables and chairs. Um, in the medium term, um, obviously the globe is is potentially quite big news for for um, Torrington, um, and then there's support, um, including these action plans in fact for you know businesses and town centres in general, um, and then in the longer term there's these sort of very broad uh, commitments towards this idea of the sustainable and inclusive economy. This is really about understanding how you retain uh, jobs in the area um, that you know young people want to stay in and can stay in uh, ensuring that people have got the skills that they need uh, to be able to take on those jobs um, this idea about the net zero carbon society um, biodiversity gain and environmental improvement is really big and i know that there's a, a lot of talk about that uh, in north devon in general anyway and then there's the third thing which is around health and well-being of our communities and and, and a lot of that is also to do with mental health um and um you know reduction particularly in rural areas of um social isolation so when it comes to the action plans um and and what what's happening in general but also what you know what's happening in in torrington so there are a number of different barriers to success. The first is really around uh, infrastructure. So, you know, um, we, we're looking at, I, I actually think you've got quite good broadband, um, unusually for a rural area. Um, but uh, transport buses is a real problem in lots of different uh, areas. You know, how can that be turned around to make sure that, that there's a lot more connection? So getting people to for jobs and that sort of thing. Uh, and training as well uh, and again you know the, the globe is a really really good start um, there need to be lots more connections with uh, education providers in the area to make sure that uh, um, there's that sustainable inclusive economy is built uh, lack of money is always a problem it's, it's only going to be more of a problem and you know in those sorts of situations um, uh, you know through, through austerity and now you know as we pay back the massive debt um, that, that that was borrowed during coronavirus um, there'll be a lot more, I think, need for people to sort of make those changes locally themselves as much as they can. Um, but I think there is some investment in some of that infrastructure. Um, and then sort of local governance and partnerships, really. Politics with a big and a small P. Um, you know, sort of, uh, it's great that there are local champions, but there also needs to be um, a lot more people sort of, sort of stepping up where they can. Um, where that governance has a lack of vision, and I'm not saying it does here at all, um, but that sort of agreement on the direction of, of, of travel, there, it isn't there, that's a real barrier to success. To success. Um, so, yes, so when it comes to the action plan, it was pretty much out of time. Um, what, I'm, what I'm really keen to do is just make it absolutely based on evidence um, a, a lot of things have been said a couple of times which really helped me to understand what's really important to the, the, the people of the town 
um, but where we can get evidence together. So in, for instance, pedestrianisation, if it's timed closure um, of the streets in the evening, it would be very interesting to understand where that's happened in other places and what, you know, wh where, that's, where that's worked and where it hasn't worked. Every place is unique, as I've said, but any evidence that we can get that says this is a, an idea for you to, to take forward would be useful. I want it to be focused on the community as much as possible. And this is not to say that there's sort of no uh, responsibility at all on any of the local authorities, but to have some focus on what can be done locally is, is, is quite important. Um, you know, when you look at what, what the, the plough has achieved locally, it's quite, it's quite extraordinary. And so much of it is to do with who's involved locally. And that's why I think you know, it's really interesting to look at that crowdfunding community share um, option for its funding. It's a really interesting one. Um, as I said, complementary to the council strategies that we've looked at already. And then, you know, I hope um, not too challenging, but I think it's important that rather than sort of always talk about the same things over years and years and years, maybe there are some opportunities to challenge you a little bit in what might be achievable in the action plan. But of course, you can always completely ignore it. Uh, so yes, that's uh, that's it as far as the action plan is concerned. What we're going to do now is there's a a period of time where I take away all of the evidence you've given me. Again, thank you so much for um, participating in this. Really appreciate it if it can go out on um, Facebook channels, both town council and district council, um, and just just because actually you, you get a lot of interaction on those on those comments pages. Um, if you've got some ideas, preferably ideas that you have a sort of chance of delivering and you can take a hand in delivering rather than wouldn't it be good if, if there's sort of no possibility of it being delivered, I would be delighted if you get in contact with me and I'm very, very happy for these contact details um, to be put onto Facebook uh, and, and obviously people can see it anyway because these are recorded. Um, and we've got probably about two to three weeks now where I'm going away and I'm writing these action plans. There will be opportunities for uh, you to give me ideas in the meantime, but as the draft comes in, it will go to Chris first, who's the client. I know that he will disseminate it, and then you will have the opportunity to say, oh, this is awful, this plan is not going to work, uh, or this plan is going to work, and we're sort of keen to take this forward. Um, and then we'll sort of finalise it at the end of October. Yeah. So I hope that's useful. Chris, over to you. No, I just say um, the, the crucial point is that this is not the end of the conversation. It's very much the start. We've had lots of reports and investigations and discussions over sort of the years. What we really need to create, and this is why I felt it was important to get Ben as an external figure, is to look at it and go, right, actually, what can we be what can we be trying to achieve from an outside perspective um, so that collectively we can go right in a similar way to in Biddeford we've developed a, a theory of change around the future high street fund is it time to have a really clear theory for this is the change that we as a community want to see in Great Torrington and how do we draw more people in and get them more excited um, so I think when I post the video, to, hopefully tomorrow, um, the more we can get that out, the more we can start drawing more people into the debate, get more people feeding into Ben's thoughts, and in line with what John was saying earlier, get more people coming and wanting to take responsibility for the future of their town and to support their community. It's just so important. Um, so for now, it's eight o'clock. Thanks everyone so, so much for getting involved. I look forward to seeing you all again in the near future. Um, and let's get this debate shared. Many thanks. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.